no creo en el capitalismo ni en el comunismo. I don't believe in capitalism or communism. My only interest is in seeing a Guatemala where they no longer kill, because they killed my father. And I know the pain when they take a father away from you. I don't want to see more mothers when they come to my office and they say, Father, they took my husband. Help me, Father. We don't want that anymore. That is why we want to do something, not to create more violence and injustice, but rather to correct the errors of the past. The errors that continue creating death and anguish among the people of God. Guatemala is the northernmost country in Central America. 30 years of military domination left 100,000 Guatemalans dead, 40,000 disappeared, and hundreds of thousands more exiled, widowed, and orphaned. These massive human rights violations, done in the name of anti-communism, forced Guatemala into international isolation. The country was in a severe social and economic crisis. On January 14, 1986, Benicio Cerezo, a Christian Democrat lawyer, was inaugurated president. The military believed a civilian president would give the government badly needed legitimacy and reduce support for the guerrilla movement. Well, in general terms, we are working in the democratic process in Guatemala, trying to build a democracy over the ba basis of uh, state of law, respect of the human rights, respect of the political opposition in the country, diminishing the repression and violence existing in the near past, and um, giving the people the confidence and they are really the actors of their own destiny. Many people hoped that the Cerezo government, which was freely elected, would make a clean break with the past military regimes. The U.S. State Department called his election the final step in the return of democracy to Guatemala. This film examines the kind of democracy existing in Guatemala today. It focuses on human rights, land reform, and continuing military control to show the problems facing the country and how the new government is hunting them. Who the people are in Guatemala and how they live present a great challenge to the democratic process. Two-thirds of Guatemala's eight million people are Mayan Indians who speak 22 different languages. They live primarily in the rural highlands. Santiago Atitlan, an Indian community. In this coffin is a three-week-old baby, too malnourished to survive a cough. Four out of five Guatemalan children below age five are malnourished. In the Indian highlands, infants die at a rate 10 times higher than in the United States. A health worker at a private nutrition center. The problem here in Santiago is that there is a lot of illness and also there isn't work for the parents. I am on the side of the children, poor things. They are hungry, they don't get enough to eat. Why? Because the fathers don't have work. Sometimes they have it, but it is very low pay. And so with the salary low and the prices of everything very high, the ends just don't need that is the problem here. 
an Indian Protestant pastor, Vitalino Similox. Many Indians are struggling so that they can do better than just barely survive. They want to have a dignified life, a life that historically corresponds to them here in this country. They are the owners of the land, the owners of everything that was taken from them. They have the right to live in a dignified way, which they have not been able to do during the last 500 years. Although they are the majority, Indians suffer a deep discrimination and have little representation in the government. Ladinos, people of mixed European and Indian blood, dominate Guatemalan politics. A small group of wealthy Ladinos controls the economy. Over 400 U.S. corporate branches, subsidiaries, and affiliates operate in Guatemala, the largest U.S. investment in all of Central America. The great majority of Guatemalans, Ladinos and Indians, rural and urban, live in poverty. Half the population is unemployed or underemployed and unable to maintain an adequate diet. Eight out of 10 people cannot afford basic necessities, such as clothing, medicine, or decent housing. Although most Guatemalans are poor, the country has rich natural resources, vast agricultural lands, oil, and minerals. Agricultural interests dominate the economy, but they are oriented toward exports, not toward feeding the people. My name is Francisco Ramirez. I was born in Santiago Atitlan. I have worked about 30 years and I have eight children. My work is hard. It's very hard to earn anything. It's hard to get enough to eat. It's very difficult. This land is mine. This little bit is mine but just a little, nothing more. I want things to be good for my children, but it's difficult because I want my children to study. But they can't because they need money to study. I just keep doing this work because what else can I do? Francisco Ramirez grows corn and beans, the staples of the rural diet. Nine out of ten peasants in the highlands have plots of land too small to support their family's basic needs. To survive, they work on the large plantations, harvesting sugarcane, coffee, cotton, and bananas. A landless worker. <laughs> I have a small parcel to live on, nothing more. I have to go to the plantations to earn my living because there's no other way. That is why I am here. But you cannot really earn anything because, look, the cane hardly weighs anything. You don't even earn two dollars a day working from five in the morning until six at night. 2% of the landowners control two-thirds of the arable land. Nowhere else in Latin America is the land distributed so unequally. Archbishop Prospero Penados del Barrio. La paz y la justicia. To have peace and justice in Guatemala is a very slow road, an historical process. For example, the land is still very poorly distributed. There is still no social justice. The wealth is in the hands of very few people. For example, the large plantations. The people who have a lot of land without cultivating it, idle lands. This land should be cultivated. 
because without a better distribution of goods, it will be difficult to have peace in Guatemala. Land has played an important role in Guatemalan history. When President Jacobo Arbenz implemented a land reform program in 1952, it infuriated Guatemala's largest landholder, the United Fruit Company. It fueled U.S. government suspicions that Arbenz was controlled by communists. In 1954, a CIA-orchestrated coup ousted Arbenz, who had been freely elected. United Fruit got its land back, and no government since, including Cerezo's, has put a significant land reform program on its agenda. Father Andres Hiron leads a movement of over 100,000 landless peasants. In May 1986, he led 16,000 peasants in a silent, 100-mile march to Guatemala City demanding that the new government make land available to them. President Cerezo promised to help. I believe it is fair to say to the president that he should stop making new policies. We have to tell the president that he must keep his word because it's been already a year since he told us that he would help us and we haven't heard anything yet. I think one of the most important issues of what many people fight for Rebel people, you know, and people who have hopes on to better the people is that land reform must be the, the issue. If we don't have it, we are going to continue to have blood and violence. Teddy Plocharski exports coffee, rubber, melons, flowers, and a spice called cardamom on his 10,000 acres of land. He is ex-president of a powerful landowners association. I don't believe land reform is the solution because it never worked before in Guatemala and it hasn't worked in Mexico, it hasn't worked in Sao or in Nicaragua. It's the behind the, the, uh, the scenery of the president is the, the military people and the landowner, you know, the big rich people, you know, who are not uh, helping him to really to make any good decision to better the people. I think the president is, is some kind of a uh, marionette who is, uh, you know, who is he's willing to do something, but he doesn't have the power to do it. The government has promised and has publicly said that they'll do anything to make sure that private property is respected. So far, we have not had any problems with that. There have been some uh, problems trying to take over farms, but the government has come out clearly and said they would not permit that. A Ladino peasant and lay church worker active in the land reform movement. It will be worth the struggle even if they finish us off, because we are hungry. We are even ready to sacrifice our children. Yes, believe it. Army Day, 1987. The Army has been the primary political force in Guatemala since 1954, maintaining power through fraudulent elections and coups. Today, the military's power has not diminished in spite of having a civilian president. During the 1970s, both Indians and poor Ladinos joined a growing popular movement protesting the military's power. They organized peasant leagues, trade unions, and student groups to demand land and other social reforms. Government security forces and death squads killed and kidnapped their leaders, calling them subversives and communists. Due to the massive human rights violations, the U.S. cut off formal military aid to Guatemala in 1977, though significant amounts were sent through other channels. The government's violence convinced many Guatemalans that reform would never come through peaceful means. For the rural Indians, taking up arms became a means of self-defense from the governmental repression. Guerrilla organizations grew stronger. By the late 1970s, several thousand armed guerrillas operated in the highlands, where they had over a quarter of a million unarmed civilian supporters. 
the Army directed its counterinsurgency campaign at the entire civilian population in that region, massacring tens of thousands of Indians, including men, women, and children. They destroyed over 400 villages. Thousands of people fled to the mountains to hide or sought refuge in Mexico. About 40,000 Guatemalan refugees live in United Nations-sponsored camps in Mexico. The refugees exhibit little confidence in the new democracy. During the first year and a half of the Cerezo administration, only 1,300 refugees from the camps returned to Guatemala. The remainder refuse to go back until certain conditions are met. In the in the first place, the government must respect our lives. In the second place, the government must give us our land. And finally, there must be real development for us, the peasants. We are afraid to return to Guatemala because we know that the army is going to kill us. This is the first contact in five years these Indians have had with the rest of the world. They were hiding in the mountains since they fled their villages, which were destroyed by the Army's counterinsurgency campaign. Since then, they have led a desperate, nomadic existence. Why did we come? Because of the suffering. We came because of the suffering. Because all of the kids, children, old people and the sick. So many of us came here. Why? Because of the army. The army is destroying all the cornfields. There's nothing. Not even tortillas. We're telling you this because the poor people are suffering hunger. The army is after us. And so that's why we came here. Several thousand Indians are said to be still hiding in remote areas. The Catholic Church is sheltering this group, but they are the exception. The great majority of people who have come out of hiding in the mountains have been forced to live in settlements called development poles. The army created them to separate the civilian population from the guerrillas. They now include over 60,000 people. A development pole called Chitu. In the early 1980s, guerrillas were active in the area. Some residents supported them. Fearing army reprisals, the people fled to the mountains. Then the army came and burned down their villages. This group hid for more than a year before turning themselves over to the army. <laughs> Defense Minister General Hector Cromajo. Well, development polls were only part of a strategy of the military government to bring service to, to rural areas, health, education and other services and to provide basic uh, housing and work. They are now uh, within the frames of the democratic government. Anyone entering or leaving the settlement must have army permission. Twice daily, the residents are expected to participate in civic activities, including speeches given by soldiers dressed in civilian clothes. Saukio Grande, another development poll. Of the 700 families, there are 125 widows. The widows here in Salkil take me, for example. My husband went on a civil patrol, and while patrolling, they ran into the subversives and they killed him. As for the husband of the other widows here, some of them haven't returned yet. Another were killed in their houses. Another were killed by the army. 
an Indian Protestant pastor, Vitalino Similox. The development poles, according to us, the Indians, are nothing more than a means of control to enclose the Indian in a given place where not only can he be controlled, but where he is made to think concepts and ideas that are not his own. They are destroying the Indian culture, erasing it from history and the rest of the population. During his campaign, President Cerezo promised to disband the development poles. But a month after taking office, he inaugurated a new one. We need all the people to forget the past and to unify, so that together we can move Guatemala forward. We have to forget the time when the people and the government were different. Now the government is of the people. I count on the backing of the army and of all the people. The army also established civilian patrols as part of its counterinsurgency plan. Half a million men patrol in 12 or 24 hour shifts as often as once a week. They are not paid. The army claims the patrols exist for people to defend their villages from the guerrillas and that they are voluntary. Yet anyone absent must pay a replacement or risk being fined or punished. This group carries rifles and bullets which they must turn in after their duty, but most patrollers are unarmed. More than anything, it is a self-policing of the population to inject the feeling that I watch my friend or my neighbor and that he also keeps track of me. Whatever I might do, I am definitely obligated to inform the army and so is the other person. For example, if I did not do my duty, if I arrived late or if I am not in my house, what has happened recently, and especially with this government, is that they have made some changes to give the appearance that it is voluntary. But the result is the same. In 1987, for the first time, the Army brought 3,000 civil patrollers to march in the Army Day Parade. The Army created both the patrols and the development poles to maintain control of the rural population. Human rights groups say this proves the lack of civilian control over the military, illustrates the weakness of democracy in Guatemala, and is a fundamental violation of human rights. A former church worker who fled his village and fears being identified. Well, the democracy is a lie, because we are not enjoying democracy. Maybe some people are enjoying it, like the rich, but for the poor people, the Indians and poor Ladinos, for us, there's no democracy. The military are the ones who have the power in Guatemala. We are not free. Guatemala is one of 10 Latin American countries which changed from military to civilian rule since 1979. A recent visitor to Guatemala awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his human rights work, Adolfo Pérez Esquivel from Argentina. Just to change the government does not mean that the problems are over. There is a strong inheritance from the dictatorships which make the work of these incipient democracies difficult. I believe it is necessary to do away with many things such as the concept of national security in the armed forces. Once and for all, the armed forces have to comprehend that they should stop being troops of occupation of their own people in order to become an integral part of a democratic liberation process for all the people. In 
1984, relatives of disappeared people organized GAM, a human rights group. GAM charges that 40,000 Guatemalans have been disappeared since 1954. Two GAM leaders were assassinated in 1985, and others received constant threats. Ninette Garcia was a founder of GAM after her husband, a trade union leader, was disappeared. Our immediate demand is the formation of an investigative commission that can tell us where they took our relatives. The uncertainty of not knowing whether they're alive or dead or what was done to them must end. President Cerezo has vacillated on forming a commission to investigate what happened to the disappeared. He also declared that no military people would be put on trial. Just before leaving office, the outgoing military government issued an amnesty decree. It prohibited prosecution of the military or security forces for abuses committed while they held office. America's Watch, a human rights monitoring group, calls the self-amnesty an attempt by murderers and torturers to pardon themselves, as well as to impede any inquiry into their activities or into the fate of their victims. Defense Minister Cromajo. In reference of the, uh, the, of the amnesty three or four days before the, the, the inauguration of the new government, it is a misunderstanding. The, the decree of amnesty was for all, every Guatemalan. It was not dedicated to military people, but military and civilian people, all that were involved in, in any way in this uh, civil war that we actually had in the country. It's not dedicated to the military. It's for everyone, and we want to go forward. We don't want to stick to the past. Media vuelta. Edmund Moulet is one of a hundred deputies in the Guatemalan Congress. He belongs to the largest opposition party, which defines itself as being in the political center. The people who are responsible for the killings, for the kidnappings, for the massacres, the people responsible for the corruption in this country are still in very important positions. Uh, in the military, in uh, the power, in the civilian uh, government. The army is not responsible for, uh, for any, any wrongdoing. The army reacts as a constitutional mandate against terrorism. And we actually were engaged in a civil war, and in a civil war people suffer. If we didn't do something against these people, then all those crimes, all those things, could happen again anytime. Trade unions suffered severe repression before Cerezo took office. During a four-month period in 1980, 77 union leaders were killed or disappeared, including six from this Coca-Cola bottling plant. A representative of Uncit Fragua, a labor federation. We are afraid that the repression that happened during the 1980s at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s might happen again. This is always true when we see the government favoring private enterprise and the same traditional power groups. This will bring the government to a crisis which means that the government will have to unleash an even greater repression in order to maintain itself in power. The, the real fact is uh, that repression diminished, almost disappeared in Guatemala. Uh, the, um, the figures, even the figures and the, the perception, the feeling of the people have changed all the way. Means that my strategy, talking with the military people, mm, uh, succeed. If there are no human rights violations, what happened to the Rachel Sissimi family? What happened to Camilo Garcia? and Basilio Tuis and Lopez Chavez? What happened to the kindergarten teacher and the family they machine gunned yesterday? What happened to the worker from Escuintla who was assassinated yesterday? We say that these are serious violations of human rights which they want to cover up by saying that they are common crimes. But it is not possible. They are political crimes. Although the number of victims may vary, 
the military structure responsible for most of the violence remains intact. Repression continues. It is most evident in the Highland region. The mayor of Santiago Atitlan. There were two other kidnappings in the month of January. And then there were two kidnappings of people walking in the mountains. Ah, and also two other people were disappeared. Just this week, Monday afternoon, there were two more who were shot on the other side of town. The only thing known, according to information from the relatives who saw it, is that they are strangers with masks and machine guns who did the killings. The army blames the guerrillas, who are still active in the area, for the disappearances. Some residents say the army is responsible. Santiago Atitlan may appear to be a tranquil lakeside community, but the continuing disappearances, army presence, and guerrilla activity put life on edge. The army's counterinsurgency campaign damaged, but did not defeat the armed guerrillas. Today, a few thousand are still active in the rural areas. Well, this, uh, uh movement, insurgent movements against the government is, uh, as I said, magnify the problems, social and economic problems of the country, and they are supported by external sources, what they call international solidarity. And mainly this is uh, East and West uh, confrontation. I don't see any connection between the land problem and insurgency. I've had personal experience with insurgency and I believe this is more of a political problem, a world power struggle between the United States and Russia. Until the day when there is a better distribution of land and of the fruits of labor in Guatemala, until there isn't much social difference, for example, between Indians and Ladinos, between workers from the country and the city. Until then, there will always exist this uneasiness. If there is poverty, there is violence. Precisely one of the causes of the guerrillas, according to them, is the social injustice. A representative of the guerrilla organization, the Guatemalan National Revolutionary Unity. Nadie puede creer en un régimen. No one can believe in a democratic process if there aren't elements which demonstrate that there is a foundation of justice and confidence and credibility in the authorities. Without those premises, it is totally false that peace or a democratic process could exist. The real reasons for our movement, for our cause, remain intact. They have not changed. As long as the causes are not removed, the struggle of our people cannot cease. I have to recognize that I, uh, I have not made enough to resolve the problems of 500 years in only one year. But I made the two or three steps to establish the settlement, the, the basis of a new era, era in Guatemala. I'm afraid that uh, we could have an explosive situation because all the, the uh, reasons for the uh, subversion, for the extreme leftists, for the Marxists, for the guerrilla groups to survive and to live in Guatemala are still there. And this government has done nothing to uh, solve those uh, social problems. Nobel Prize winner Adolfo Perez Esquivel this generates a series of questions. What kind of democracy are we talking about? A real democracy or a formal democracy where nothing changes? The only way to consolidate a democratic process is through the full respect of human rights and the right to justice for everyone equally. And this is still not the case in Guatemala.
dear Mr. President, I have to tell that I came to United States... President Cerezo has traveled widely to convince the world that Guatemala is now enjoying democracy. The United States resumed military aid to Guatemala in 1983 and has increased it since Cerezo took office. The U.S. and many other countries have also dramatically increased their economic aid. President Cerezo has been a strong leader in Central American peace efforts. But inside Guatemala, if the Cerezo government is simply a mask for continuing military control without seriously confronting the land and human rights problems, then it is unlikely that his own country will have a lasting peace. An estimated 200,000 children lost one or both parents in the violence. Their memories may recede with time, but their painful past has already left its mark. We asked one orphan if he thought there could ever be peace in his country. Well, no. It's impossible. Well, it's impossible. Because you can't get peace just signing a paper. Every day the violence goes from bad to worse. That's all. Maybe there will be peace within a few years, but for now there's no peace, because as long as there's hunger, there's no peace. The struggle for peace and democracy in Guatemala has a long history. Despite the extraordinarily high price the Guatemalan people have already paid, their struggle continues. God called to the people of Israel who were dying of hunger in Egypt. They were given the great task of making bricks. So God said, I will take you away and give you my land. But did he simply give them the land? No, they invaded it because others held it by force. Today, other people are holding our lands by force. And so now we are going to take them. Yeah, 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 yeah. 